I want us to read Scripture together. So will you take your Bibles, open to Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and let's all stand for the reading of Scripture together. The Old Testament book of Micah chapter 5, verse 2. You go to the book of Matthew and make a left, and you go back a few books and you'll come to the book of Micah. And want us to stand and honor the reading of Scripture this morning. Micah chapter 5, verse number 2. Micah 5, 2. You should be there. Let me read this verse. Follow along with me. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Let's bow for prayer together. Father, thank you for your word. I pray that you'll help me, Lord, as your servant, to make it clear today to exalt our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we leave here today, may we not be the same as when we came. Holy Spirit, I pray that you'll take your word and use it to uh, penetrate hearts. If there's someone here today that's never come to Jesus Christ, recognizing him as the Son of God, the Savior of the world, and they they have never repented and turned to him, I pray that they will today. Lord, and may your word encourage these who are your children who know you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I want to talk this morning about a Christmas prophecy. I think this is perhaps one of the greatest prophecies in the Old Testament. And I just want to look at this one verse with you here today. I want our minds to think about uh, Bethlehem and think about our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Anyone that knows anything about the Christmas story knows that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. I should say almost everyone knows that. According to the Book of Mormon, the Book of Mormon says Jesus was born in Jerusalem. Well, that's wrong. Uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, two different places. And the Bible makes that very clear. Nothing about the life of Jesus was accidental or coincidental. It was all according to the providential hand of God. Everything about the life of our Lord Jesus, including his birth and and the place of his birth, was meticulously planned by God. So we have to ask ourselves one question. Why Bethlehem? Uh, Of all places for the king of kings to be born. Jesus wasn't just a king. He was the king of kings. He's the king of all kings, the greatest king ever that will ever be. Of all places for Jesus to be born, why Bethlehem? Why not Rome? Rome was the greatest city of that day. It was the first city to reach one million in population. That was 130 years before Christ. It was the political capital of the world. Why not Rome? Why not Jerusalem? The temple was in Jerusalem. It was the religious capital of the world at that time. It was called the holy city of God. But Jesus wasn't born in Jerusalem. He wasn't born in Rome. He was born in Bethlehem, this little village, this little out-of-the-way town. We probably wouldn't know anything about this town at all today had not Jesus been born there. So do you ever wonder why God chose this specific place? Think of it. The greatest miracle in human history, the greatest birth in human history, all took place there in Bethlehem. The hinge of history is on the door of a Bethlehem stable. Well, I want to give you just a few thoughts out of this one prophecy that we see here, because I think we answer that question why, as we look at this verse And we see some of the things that are in this verse, distilled in this one verse, is so much about the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're taking notes, I want you to see the first thing. This the the fact that his birth would be in Bethlehem teaches us that the Messiah would fulfill prophecy. Very simply, why Bethlehem? Because this was the place that was prophesied in the Old Testament, right here by the prophet Micah. And again, I think this is one of the greatest prophecies in the Bible. But I want you to look at the detail of this verse. It tells us that there would be a ruler. Look at it again. But thou Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. It tells us who? The ruler. Uh, Now, all Jewish rabbis knew that this was a reference to the coming Messiah. The Old Testament scholar Walt Kaiser said that the prophets avoided using the word king because of the pagan connotations to it. And so thus the Messiah would be called ruler. It tells us the person. It tells us where. Notice where it says Bethlehem Ephrathah. 
This is the place where he would be born. Uh, again, I want you to notice the precise detail of the prophecy. It doesn't say that he was born in Bethlehem, period. It says that he would be born in Bethlehem, Ephrata. Well, you might th think, well, what's the big deal? I mean, there's only one Bethlehem, right? Wrong. Did you know that in Jesus' day there was more than one Bethlehem? There were actually two Bethlehems. There was one that was located in the northern territory that was actually just five miles away from Nazareth, which is where Joseph and Mary lived at that time. It was sometimes called Bethlehem Zebulun. And then there was another Bethlehem located in the south of Israel. That would be 80 miles away. It was a very small town. And so you say, which town was Jesus born in? And, and the Bible, again, makes it very clear. It wasn't Bethlehem in the north, Zebulun. And I, probably if Micah would have stopped right at Bethlehem and not said Bethlehem Ephrata, probably many people would have assumed that it would be Bethlehem in the north territory. After all, again, it's only five miles away from Nazareth, but they would be wrong. Uh, this, that would have been the wrong place. Jesus was born in Bethlehem in the southern territory, the territory of Judah, which is just five miles away from Jerusalem, again, 80 miles away from uh, Nazareth. Uh, this journey would have taken about a week. And I have to remember that Mary was pregnant. She was about to have this baby. This would have been a difficult journey, you can imagine, for her to ride a donkey all the way from uh, Nazareth down to Bethlehem, probably a very bumpy ride. I can remember back when my wife was going to have a baby on several occasions, and we were in the car riding, and every bump in the road, she would just kind of look at me like, you know, you missed a few bumps, you know. And I would say, honey, I don't make the roads. I just try to drive them. Uh, you can imagine uh, how difficult this would be for Mary. Uh, and again, if Micah would have just said Bethlehem, you would have thought it would be up there in the north. But again, verse 2 makes it very clear. It was the Bethlehem in the territory of Judah. In fact, later on in Matthew, when the wise men come seeking Jesus, uh, and Herod hears about this, and Herod goes to the, uh, to the scribes and says, you know, where is all this going to take place? You remember in that passage, they pointed back to this very verse here, Micah 5.2, because this was the place that the prophet talked about, Bethlehem of Judea. They quoted this verse. He's going to be born just a few miles outside of Jerusalem here, right down here in Bethlehem, Bethlehem of Judea. They all knew where Jesus was going to be born. Now, that's amazing to me that this prophecy took place 700 years before the birth of Christ. 700 years. That would be like predicting who the president of the United States is going to be, a born, a be from 700 years from now. That's assuming there still is a U.S. in 700 years. But if someone, if someone could predict uh, where the, that president will be born, just imagine all the contingencies that have to happen in order for that to take place. That is not something that any man could do. That is only something that God can do. And in fact, when Micah gives this verse, he's quoting the God himself. Uh, it's God who's speaking here when it says, But thou, Bethlehem of Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands, yet... Out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. And so this is fulfilled prophecy right here in this verse. I think one of the greatest evidences that the Bible is the word of God is the fulfilled prophecy. It's incredible that this took place just the way the prophet predicted. Uh, there was a brilliant philosopher who lived in 100 AD. His name was Justin uh, he was a skeptic, but he began to study Bible prophecy, and he got saved, and he became committed to the Lord, so much so that he was martyred for his faith, and now we call him Justin the Martyr. And this is what Justin the Martyr said. He said, to declare a thing shall come to pass long before it comes to being, then bring it to pass. This or nothing is the work of God. This is the work of God, to declare this thing, and then it happened. Only God knows the future, and you know why? Because he determines the future. Just write down Isaiah 46, verse 9. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Listen, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel 
shall stand, I will accomplish all my purpose. This prophecy to me is one among many that proves that the Bible is the Word of God. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, that really doesn't prove anything. In fact, this is just a coincidence. Really, you think so? There's a principle, you may be aware of it, it's called the science of probability. It's also called the principle of probability. Um, And this was a principle that was invented by Peter Stoner, who is the professor of science at Westmont College. Peter Stoner and his students, which happened to be about 600 students from 12 classes, they, they all had this one project. They all looked at this one verse, Micah 5, 2, and they looked at this one prophecy, and what they did was this. They determined the average population of Bethlehem from the time of Micah to the present. Then they divided it by the average population of the earth during the same period, and they determined that the chances of this prophecy being fulfilled as it was predicted in Scripture was one in 300,000. One in 300,000. But that's just one prophecy. They added seven more specific prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. The chances of all eight of those prophecies happening was one in 10 with 17 zeros. Think about that. One in 10 with 17 zeros. I can't count that high. I'm not sure what the numerical term would even be there. But really, to illustrate it, that's hard for us to even imagine. So, This is what Peter Stoner did. In order for us to really understand how difficult this would be, he gave this illustration. He said this. He said, cover the entire state of Texas with silver dollars to a level of two feet deep. In order to do that, it would take a a total number of silver dollars. It would be 10 to the 17th power. That's how many silver dollars would cover the entire state of Texas, two feet deep. He said, now you take one of those silver dollars, and you mark it with an X, a big X on that silver dollar. He said, then you throw it back into the state, and then you mix up all the silver dollars. He said, then you take a man, and you blindfold this man, and you tell this man he can walk all over Texas wherever he wants to, and at random let him reach down and pick up a silver dollar. Do you know the chances of him picking up that one silver dollar marked with an X would be one and 10 to the 17th power. How many of you think that just at random, walking through the state of Texas, he could reach down and just at random pick up that one silver dollar? That's an impossibility, you see. And so this is shows us that this prophecy of Micah, along with seven others that Jesus fulfilled, it wasn't any coincidence, dear friend. It was the hand of Almighty God showing us that this was all of the Lord. But that's not all. Do you know how many prophecies that Jesus fulfilled? 456 prophecies that the Bible gives that Jesus was the Messiah, and yet he fulfilled all of them. And Matthew in his gospel, if you ever read Matthew's gospel, you'll see that he's very careful to point out these prophecies, just a few of them, that He would say this was spoken by the Old Testament prophecy, and he would go on and he would mention it. You know why? Because he's trying to convince the people that Jesus really is the Messiah, and there's no greater evidence than to show that this was prophesied hundreds of years ago in the Old Testament. And do you know why Matthew lists these prophecies? Because in his day there were many going around saying that Jesus couldn't be the Messiah. He couldn't possibly be the Messiah because he was from Nazareth. And they would say this, they would say, everyone knows that the Messiah was going to come from Bethlehem, not out of Nazareth. They would say this, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? In John 7, 27, it says this, we know this man, whence he is, we know where he's from, we know he can't be the Messiah, they were saying, because he is from Nazareth. The Messiah is supposed to come from Nazareth. Bethlehem. Again, listen to John 7, 41. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? And so there was this dispute going on, even in Matthew's day, saying Jesus couldn't possibly be the Messiah because he is from Nazareth. And the scripture says he will come from 
Bethlehem. So Matthew wants to clear up this misunderstanding, and he says he was from Bethlehem. He was born there. And the people that lived there, they couldn't understand how Jesus could be from Bethlehem if his parents lived in Nazareth, which is far north. How could he be born in Bethlehem, 80 miles south? Why would a woman who's nine months pregnant take that trip over that difficult terrain? And actually, you would be traveling up into Bethlehem because it's a hill country. This would make the trip very, very difficult. Why in the world would they take that journey with a woman who's about to give birth? Well, we know the answer to that because Luke tells us, remember? In Luke chapter 2, in fact, won't you hold your place here in Micah? Go to the New Testament. Look in the book of Luke chapter 2, Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. And notice what it says in Luke chapter 2, a passage that we know very well and we read often here at Christmas time, Luke chapter 2, verse 1, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. In verse 2, And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. All went to be taxed, everyone into his what? His own city. And so here's Mary. She's about to have a child of the Holy Ghost, the Bible says. She's nine months pregnant. But her and Joseph, they live in Nazareth. That's their home. That's where they live. If she gives birth in Nazareth, then Jesus could not be the Messiah because he would not fulfill the Scripture. And the Word of God would fail if he was born in Nazareth. Jesus could not be the one who fulfilled Old Testament prophecies. You realize that if he didn't fulfill just one prophecy, he wouldn't qualify to be the Savior. And so something had to happen to get Joseph and Mary out of Nazareth to Bethlehem at the right time, at the very time she's going to deliver a child. And what happens? Well, from the world's perspective, there's a man by the name of Caesar Augustus who comes to rule the throne, the Roman Empire. Little does he know, he thinks he's in control. Little does he know that God is the one who's in control. I think about that today. You know, some of these powerful politicians think they're in control. Friend, God's in control. Here's Caesar Augustus. His name Augustus, by the way, Augustus means the great one. You think he thought a lot about himself? The great one, Augustus, the honorable one. In fact, our month of August is named after this guy. The great one. He's the nephew of Julius Caesar. He became the emperor when Julius Caesar was murdered. And uh, here he is. He was a very remarkable man by the standards of history. He did a lot. He was a man of military skill. He was a great politician. He ended the civil wars. He brought in the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And yet, here he is thinking he's in control. And so he decides that he's going to give us, take a census. And the census was for the purpose of taxes. And for our passage, there are two things to note that are of importance here. In order for people to be taxed, Jews would have to return to their ancestral home. That's one thing that we see. That's why Joseph and Mary left Nazareth in order to, uh, to obey the law, to be a part of this census. They had to leave Nazareth and they had to go to Bethlehem, the ancestral home of Mary and Joseph. But here, there's another thing that's interesting here. I mean, he could have put it off. You would have thought that Joseph would say, you know, when my, my, my wife, she's going to have a child. We'll just do this after the baby's born, and then we'll go to Bethlehem, and then we'll, you know, do all the paperwork we need to do. But there was something else that had to happen in order to make this possible for this scripture to be fulfilled. And I think that there had to be a deadline, right? I mean, why else would he leave at that moment when his wife's about to give birth? There was a deadline. You ever heard of it? Anybody know the date April 15th? That date come to register in your mind. We all know what that date means. There's a deadline. You got to get all your taxes done by that date or face the penalty. So there had to be some kind of deadline that Joseph knew about, even though it's really not stated in the word of God. This is something that Joseph couldn't put off. He had to do this. Why else would Joseph and Mary go down to Bethlehem in the dead of winter? 
when it would be cold, when it would be rainy, when it would be snowy? Why would she take this trip being nine months pregnant? Again, it shows that God is the one who's in control. And at that moment, they left Nazareth. They went down to Bethlehem. This is no coincidence that Caesar Augustus made this decision. It's no coincidence that he gave these deadlines. Again, had it been weeks later or days later or earlier, it would not have been the right time. It had to be the exact right time. And thus, the prophecy of Micah was fulfilled exactly as the Lord said. There was nothing coincidental about this. This happened exactly the way God wanted it to happen. And a friend, this is just one prophecy. Again, there are hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament. But all these things show us that God is in control. His word is true. Jesus is the Savior of the world, the Son of God, the Messiah. There's another thing about this prophecy. Look again in Micah 5 to go back there because I want to something else I think this verse points out. And that is that the Messiah will exalt the lowly. In Micah 5, 2, it says, But thou, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel. Now, notice where it says, though thou be little. Little is the word sair in the Hebrew. It means insignificant, least in privileges, least in desirability. In other words, Bethlehem was small. It was an insignificant village. It was not even mentioned on the, the list of cities that needed to be conquered in the book of Joshua because it was so small, it was so insignificant, it was overlooked. Only, the only ones who lived there were farmers and shepherds. And it says here, though thou be little among the thousands, the thousands of what? Thousands of other towns that were around it. It was the least significant. When the wise man came looking for the, the uh, Son of God, or when they came looking for the king of the Jews, they didn't go to Bethlehem. Where did they go? They went to Jerusalem. They thought, surely he'll be born here. And he, they had to be pointed to go to this small city. But Matthew, when Matthew quotes it again, hold your place in Micah. Go back to Matthew and look in the book of Matthew. With me. I want you to see a little difference here. Matthew chapter 2 and verse number 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, it says, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, now here they are, they're quoting Micah 5 too. In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, but thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judea, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people. Now, Matthew does two things with this passage. First of all, he changes Ephrata to Judah, which is really just the same thing, same place. But then Micah says, though you are little or least... But here Matthew says, you are by no means little or least. Now someone would come along and say, ah, there's a contradiction. Uh, in the Bible, that's not a contradiction, friend. It's actually a wonderful blessing. Because what Matthew is doing, he's highlighting what Micah really meant. He's actually giving an interpretation to Micah 5 too. And what he's saying is this, even though this village of Bethlehem is insignificant, it will become truly great. Why? Because Jesus would be born in there. That's why it would become great. Because Jesus would be there. Micah, he understood that uh, this town would grow in its greatness. That which was insignificant would be made significant. That which was poor will be made rich. And friend, you know what? That speaks to us of the Messiah because that's what he does for anyone. When Jesus is born in you, when you're born again, you know what? You become great. The world might look at you as being insignificant, but friend, you are a child of God because Jesus has touched your life. The last shall be first and the first shall be last. The world might look upon Christians today and say, oh, they're in last place. But friend, one day we're going to be in first place and they're going to be in last place. Why? Because of Jesus. 
Bethlehem would be exalted because the Messiah would be born there. Even today, if you go over to Bethlehem, I've been to this place. You try to get in to see the place where Jesus was born. You know what? There are crowds of people. Good luck trying to get in there. Because people come from all over the world. They want to just see. There's the church of the nativity that's there. And there's the location where Jesus was born. And there's throngs of people. Every time I go there to Bethlehem, you can hardly get in there. People from all over come. Why would they come to this place? Because that's where the Messiah was born. It became great because of Jesus. And dear friend, the same is true of any person who receives Jesus. You become exalted. Remember, this was the theme of Mary's song. When Mary sang her song in Luke chapter 1, she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. And then she goes on and gives a great reason why. But then she says, as he has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. Jesus brought a reversal. Those who think they're mighty, Friend, if they don't know Jesus, they're not. And those who do know Jesus, you are exalted because of knowing him. The Messiah will fulfill prophecy. The Messiah will exalt the lowly. But here's a third thing. The Messiah will be the Son of God. Again, look at Micah 5, 2. Look again what it says. But thou Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, Listen to this, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. God the Father chose Bethlehem as the place where the miracle of the incarnation would take place, where God would become a man. Notice where it says, he shall come forth unto me. In the Hebrew, that's in the emphatic position. We could say it like this, unto me or for me shall he come forth. The first reason for this event taking place was for the glory of God the Father. For me, he shall come forth. But here, notice where it says, his goings forth have been of old from everlasting. The word everlasting, olam, it's used in connection with God. It can only mean from eternity on. We could say it like this, he came from where? Eternity. He came from eternity. The beginning of Jesus was not in maternity, it was in eternity. He came from eternity. God became a man. And again, this is the greatest miracle in human history. Truly God and yet truly man. When God was born as a man, as a baby there in Bethlehem and grew into being a man, fully God, fully man. Jerry Vines imagines Jesus going into the temple. You remember when he was 12 years old, he went into the temple and had a a discussion with the uh, teachers there, the professors And he imagines him going in when he's 12 years old, and one of those learned doctors kind of stroking his beard and looking at Jesus and saying, son, how old are you? And Jesus saying, well, on my mother's side, I'm 12 years old. But on my father's side, I'm older than my mother and as old as my father. You see, he was both God and man. On his mother's side, he got thirsty. On his father's side, he said, I'm the water of life. On his mother's side, he got hungry. On his father's side, he took a little lad's lunch and he fed 5,000 people. On his mother's side, he was homeless. He didn't have a place to lay his head. On his father's side, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. All of it belongs to him. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. On his mother's side, he wept at the grave of Lazarus. On his father's side, he said this, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And friend, I know it's a mystery. I can't can't explain it all. But the Bible says, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. He would be the Son of God. Now, I'm out of time. So let me just mention two things briefly. Just just one other thing, really. The Messiah would be the bread of life. Did you know that Bethlehem, actually the word means, Beth, Beth, from the Hebrew word house, Lehem, bread, house of bread. He was born in the house of bread. He was born in Bethlehem. The fields in and around Bethlehem produced the grain that made bread in that region. So it was known for its being a place that was fruitful. Actually, the word Ephrata means fruitful. 
And again, this points to the fact that Jesus would be the bread from heaven, the bread of life. That would sustain a person, not physically, but spiritually. Let me ask you a question, friend. Are you hungry today? I'm not talking about physically hungry. We're all physically hungry right now. And you say, preacher, I wish you'd hurry up. I'm almost done. But the hunger I'm talking about is a spiritual hunger that nothing can fulfill except Jesus. You can try all the other things that the world might offer, but it will not satisfy you. It will not fill you. Jesus is the living bread that came down from heaven. And Jesus said this. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. John 6, 34. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And again, he's referring there to a spiritual hunger. I want to tell you something, friend. The greatest gift you can ever receive at Christmas is Jesus, who will fill your heart, who will satisfy your soul. He is the bread of of life, the bread that came down from heaven. That's why Bethlehem, that's why Jesus would be born there. Let me just close with this one thing. Philip Brooks was one of America's greatest preachers of the 19th century. He was often referred to as the Prince of Preachers. In 1865, Philip Brooks made a pilgrimage to Palestine, and he decided that on Christmas Eve, he would ride on horseback from Jerusalem down to Bethlehem, and he actually did that. Uh, He just rode along there, saw the sights, rode into Bethlehem. There on New Year's Eve, he imagined what it would have been like, or excuse me, Christmas Eve, he imagined what it would have been like. He went to the Church of the Nativity, the church I was telling you about that was actually built in A.D. 326. He worshiped there from 10 until 3 in the morning. He said later it was one of the greatest experiences of his life. Three years later, he was looking for a a song for... uh, a new, a new Christmas carol for his children to sing at his church. And he had written down a poem of his experience there when he went to Bethlehem. And he gave it to uh, his Sunday school superintendent and asked him to kind of compose a little melody to that song. And Redner, his Sunday school superintendent, struggled over it. But he said later he awoke in the middle of the night and the, the melody came to him. He said he believed it was the Lord that gave him that melody as a gift from heaven. And we know that now as a song that we sing at Christmas time, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Listen to the words of it as we close. O Little Town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Listen to this, O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray, cast out our sin and enter in. Be born in us today. That summarizes the whole reason for Jesus coming. Cast out our sin, enter in, be born in us today. He came that you might be born again that you might have everlasting life in heaven. During our announcements, I talked about two of our wonderful saints here at church that we're going to miss so very dearly, Miss Margaret Washington, Mr. Frank Ashley, that have blessed us. They've been faithful to the Lord. And, you know, I've known Mr. Frank Ashley since I was 15 years old. Constant source of encouragement. But you know what? We can rejoice even though we have sorrow. You know why? We know where they are. We know they're in heaven. We know that they're enjoying the presence of the Lord. And the Bible says in his presence, there is joy exceeding, full of glory. So that's why we, even though we sorrow, we can rejoice. You see, friend, that's the reason for Jesus coming right there. He came that you might have life, everlasting life. Because I want to tell you something, dear friend. Every person here, you're going to face death. Death is coming for all of us. I heard of a new statistic out there. One out of every one die. No one's getting out of this. Short of Jesus Christ coming, we're all going to face death. And the question is, are you ready for it? This is the reason for Jesus coming. So that when death comes, we don't have to be afraid. We can say, I know where I'm going. I know whom I have believed. 
I know that I'll be in the presence of Christ. And friend, the joy and the glory of heaven is beyond comprehension. That's why Christ came to Bethlehem, was born in Bethlehem. That's why he lived a sinless life. That's why he, was, he died on the cross, that you and I might have life. Let's bow together for prayer today. And so, Lord, as we come to you today, we, with all our heart, dear Father, thank you for the precious gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Lord, the Messiah who fulfilled prophecy, our Messiah, Lord, who exalts the lowly. Lord, we're nothing without Jesus. The Messiah who is the Son of God, who came to give us life, the Messiah who is the bread of life, who feeds our hungry soul, and we feed upon him continually every day. Lord, you sustain us, you strengthen us. And I pray that if there's someone here today that has never turned to Christ as Savior, oh, how I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would so move in their heart that they would see their need. Come to Jesus And as the song says, cast out their sin and enter in that Christ would be born in them today. How many here with heads bowed and eyes closed would say, that's my desire. I want to come to Christ today. I want to know him as my Savior. I haven't ever done this before, but I'm coming to Jesus today. I'm turning to him. I want to pray for you, friend. Is that your prayer? Would you just lift your hand so I can pray for you? I don't want to embarrass you but I want to lead you to the Lord Jesus. And we want to pray for you. Anyone here? Can you say, I've never done that, but I want to today? Anybody here? Would you be willing to pray right where you are? Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Savior, the Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life. And I turn to you today, and I ask you to save me, Jesus. Save me. Friend, pray that. If you haven't done it, pray it. And and let us know. We want to pray with you. We want to rejoice with you that you might know Jesus. Father, bless these words again to hearing hearts. We pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.